In this video, I'm going to go into more details in how fermentation works. So here you can see a typical fermenter. So if it's spelled with an O, it's the vessel where the fermentation takes place. If you have fermenter with an E, then it's the microorganism that actually is responsible for the fermentation. So we've known for a really long time what fermentation actually is. So in 1865, Louis Pasteur was the first to discover that this process occurs because of microorganisms. So you probably know pasteurized milks, uh, and he figured out that if we can kill these microorganisms, we can prolong the lifetime, for instance, food and drinks, and we know this very well for the milk. Now, if you think of fermentation, a lot of people seem to associate this with the food and drinks industry, and think of the conversion of glucose into ethanol. So for instance, the process where we have beer or If we consider the definition of fermentation, it's much more than that though. So it always involves microorganisms, which can, for instance, be bacteria, can be yeast. It also occurs within our body, which I will get back to. But it is the breakdown of compounds into something else. And that something else is often a byproduct for the cell. But when you look at, for instance, the food and drink industry, this can come in quite handy for us. So examples, and I said the most common example is where we take uh, sugars and convert that into ethanol. But also fermentation occurs, for instance, when you're baking bread or pizza, where you will see that carbon dioxide is formed, which is instrumental into getting our baked goods. Other examples, lactic acid in your muscles. So think when you have uh, very sore calves, you have anaerobic respiration, you start to form lactic acid. But, and I'll come back to this later, it's also very important that you can use this process of fermentation to, for instance, produce vaccines. So therefore, fermentation is very crucial for a number of different processes, ranging from food and drinks, to pharmaceutical products, such as, for instance, vaccines, but also production of dyes. So here you will see how the process of fermentation occurs in general. So we have the upstream process, which is in general the reaction, and then we have a downstream process where you look at separation and purification. So usually what you do, you start off with the microorganisms, but you have to get it to an appropriate quantity. So it means that you would have like a propagator into which you make sure you get to the right concentration of the microorganism that you need. So you're basically culturing it until you have a desired uh, quantity, which you can measure, for instance, by using the optical density. Now this propagator can be something as small as your shake flasks, or it can be a bigger reactor. What you then do is you take this, you inoculate it into a bioreactor, which for instance often can be sterilized, and then you start uh, the fermentation reaction. It's very important that you use sensors here to control the process, so you need to control a number of critical process parameters. But what is particularly important is that you need to make sure that the microorganism has sufficient uh, nutrients, if it's an aerobic process, you need to make sure that you control the oxygen content and then you need to monitor that your product is formed. And once you've harvested the product, you go to the downstream process. So this actually becomes more complicated because here you will first need to look at purification and separation, which often will involve not just one separation system and it might not just have one reactor, but almost like a series of different units that it has to pass through. And you will look at your packaging and also very important to look at the quality control and particularly when you're working with pharmaceutical products you need to make sure that it adheres to the right safety standards. So this is actually a very complicated aspect of the process. Now let's consider what are important cell requirements. First thing you need to consider is this an anaerobic process or do we need to spark in oxygen and is it an aerobic process because that will change a lot around the design of the reactor. Then you need to think about, we have the nutrients that we've got and how do I provide sufficient agitation in order to make sure there's a uniform distribution of, for instance, the oxygen, but also of the nutrients. And in this case, you will need to look at the microorganism that you work with and see what are the requirements that you need to consider. For instance, some of these uh, cells can be very sensitive towards shear. So you need to make sure there's sufficient agitation in order to have your optimal distribution of nutrients and for instance oxygen, 
but you also can't expose the cells to too much shear stress. Now, as the process goes along, it generally fall, follows a similar pattern. You would have a lag phase in which you will not see the growth of the microorganisms. So it always takes some time to settle. Then we go to the log phase or the exponential phase, and there you will see there is an exponential growth pattern. So this is probably the phase you want to be in, in order to make sure that there's no cell death occurring, there's just rapid cell growth. And this really depends on the cell culture that you've got. So you need to think about how long this will take. And you can use some simple equations, such as for instance, monad kinetics, in order to estimate what you are. So we have a lag phase, then we have an exponential growth phase, and then you get to a stationary phase. And here you will see there's an equilibrium between the cells growing, but also between the cells dying. Um, and in this case, you need to consider the death rate that you have, but you might also consider that there are mutations occurring within your microorganism. So you need to very carefully check where you are in the cell cycle. The first example I'm going to talk about is GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein. Well, if you look at the name, you can obviously see where the name is coming from, because it's clearly very fluorescent and very green. There are a variety of different microorganisms you can use, but E. coli, or recombinant E. coli, which means the genes are modified, is the most common one. And this is a typical factor because it reproduces very fast and it's very low cost. So general compounds you would need then is the nutrient to make sure that the E. coli uh, can actually reproduce. You would often need to have some kind of stabilizer to make sure the system is stable. We add the antibiotic then to further protect the purity. We need the inducer in order to switch on the gene. And finally, what's often used in bioreactors is that you need some kind of anti-foaming agent. Now, the foam formation can be a real problem. Uh, and that's why in uh, bioreactors, you normally don't use the full length of the column, but you often have some headspace in order to make sure that there's a place for the foam to go to. And you can use certain sensors to look at the levels in order to uh, determine how much of the antifoaming agent you will need to add. Now you have the antibiotic for the purity, but obviously sterilization can be a real problem in these reactions as well. So because all of these microorganisms are very prone to adhere to surfaces. So before the start of your reaction, when you inoculate, it's very common to have a sterilization in place to make sure there's no interference with your growth process. So that's just one typical example. Let's have a look at something more topical where we look at vaccine production. Now, not all vaccines are prepared in this way, but this is just an example of how you would be able to do it using a, a fermenter. So the first steps are essentially the same. You would have potentially a propagator in order to get it to the right concentration. Then you inoculate it, prepare the culture, and then you infect it and start the fermentation. So once you infect it, it will actually start to produce virus-like particles or VLPs. So the name kind of implies that it, it's not the virus itself, but it's something that looks like it. So as soon as they start replicating and you know that you've got enough of it, that's where you need to collect the cells and you need to rupture them or you need to find a way in order to extract the virus-like particles from the cells itself. So they will vary quite significantly in size. So for instance, based on some membranes and some size separations, you can work out what's the best approach to do this. And then finally, as I mentioned before, you have this upstream versus the downstream processes, where you will have a very complicated process in order to enable the purification and the quality analysis of what you have. Now, vaccine production is a typical example where you can produce it both in batch, what tended to be the more conventional approach, and is moving towards continuous production. So particularly when you start producing larger quantities, it has certain economic advantages to work on the continuous conditions. Well, particular challenges here with the fermentation or also with the vaccine production in general is that the scale-up process is not that simple. So you can use a scale-out approach where you use multiple reactors. So rather than making it on a bigger scale, you just add more of the modules of more of the reactors. But because the scale-up doesn't tend to be geometrical, you would have to consider a lot of things in order to make sure that the conditions remain more or less the same for the cells. 
So that is a definite complication that you need to look at. So let's go through a short summary of the fermentation process that we had a look at. You will see that fermentation is very important for many daily products that we use. So it's for food, it's for beverages, but also things such as production of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, or types. Now, the general process is that we would start off with a propagator in order to make sure that we have enough of the microorganism that will actually make sure that the fermentation happens. So we make sure that we've got enough of it and then we inoculate the reactor. And when we do this, we have to take special consideration with the sterility of the system to make sure that there's nothing that can potentially interfere with the purity of our system. We're working in general with a very complicated medium. So we make it sound very easy and we say we have a microorganism and it feeds on something and then we have a final product. But in reality, what I've shown with the two examples, you often need to add some stabilizers, biochemical inducer to make sure the reaction happens, sometimes antibiotics, sometimes anti-foaming agents. So the mixing of that uh, that nutrient composition can become really complicated. And then we're not even talking about an aerobic system where we also need to make sure that we supply enough oxygen. Now in order to do this we have specific sensors, uh, which uh, you can also have a look at in other videos in order to monitor this process. And then we finally, even if we've done that, we come to what I think is even the more complicated side of things. We actually have the crude product but then we need the downstream processing in order to make sure that we have something that meets a very strict regulations and quality analysis that we need for certain products. So I'll later talk about some more of the, the downstream processing, but if you are interested in other types of bioreactors that we can use, such as for instance perfusion reactors, then have a look at some other videos within this playlist. Thanks for watching.